Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the Straight Talk Vermont show. Straight Talk Vermont is a program of Service Rendered Incorporated, our parent nonprofit. So I'm Bruce Wilson, the executive director. And um, today, I'm honored to have a wonderful, incredible guest and a friend of mine who served on a legislator, Vermont legislator, and lieutenant governor. And so, David Zuckerman, how are you doing, sir? I'm good. Thanks for having me, Bruce. It's nice to, to be on the show with you. Thank you. I, I know. It's always good to see you. Absolutely. We see each other far apart here and there through yeah. all the years. Well, I get off on the farm and don't come into town as much anymore. Yeah. So, yeah. I know. I don't know how long we've been doing so 20 years. I don't know. I'm going to guess. Something. Yeah. It's a long way back then. That's right. Yeah. So, um, let's do, you know, for people who don't really know you, who should, I probably do. <laughs> I'm sure they do. But um, can you talk about a little bit about um, what, what you did in, within the legislators? Sure. Uh, well, I served for 14 years in the House mm -hmm. uh, from a district right here in Burlington. I lived actually right around the corner from these studios on uh, Dan's Court and Germain Street and uh, different parts around the, the hill section here and represented Burlington for 14 years in the House. And, uh, and then when we found land to buy in Hinesburg, we, we I left the legislature for a couple of years and uh, expanded our farm and then a Senate seat opened up in Chittenden County and I won that and served for four years. And right, so yeah. for 18 years, I was a policymaker and uh, I, you know, I was inspired by Bernie uh, as a student at UVM back in uh, 92 yeah. that politics could be different. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of politics has gone different in a sour way these days, but that uh, like with Bernie, uh, whether you agree with him or you disagree with him, he, he stays focused on the issues that he cares about. He tells you what he thinks. Mm -hmm. And he says, look, agree with me or disagree with me, that's fine, but I'm not going to just be a finger to the wind politician. Mm -hmm. And so he really inspired me as a young person who was cynical about politics. I thought, wow, here's a guy that could be independent of corporate money, independent of the party politics that goes on, and is fighting for things I care about. So. Um, when I volunteered for him as a student in 92, I started to meet people locally. That opened the door to me to then run. I lost in 94 and I won in 96. And when I was there, I, um, I really tried to put forward issues and ideas that maybe some other folks weren't in districts that they could do that in. So whether it was reforming our cannabis laws to bring that above board, whether it was discussing uh, GMOs and farming and regulating this new technology that was really... Uh, going to expand agrochemical use and expansion to be bigger farms, mm -hmm. uh, raise the minimum wage, universal health care, uh, a, a range of things. Um, my spouse, we were talking before the show, has uh, Lyme disease and the long-term effects of that and trying to elevate the opportunity for medical professionals to use alternative practices to try to treat Lyme disease. So it was a wide range of things. And, and the biggest thing was that uh, I tried to work on these issues with um, people from around the state. You know, it wasn't just about being in Montpelier and trying to convince my colleagues by the conversations we would have, but it was also really getting out around the state and meeting with people who cared about these same issues and helping them understand how to um, positively influence their own legislator, share with them information, become a resource for those legislators. Because most people don't realize that all the folks that serve in Montpelier pretty much have no staff. So they're only getting information from whatever constituents call or lobbyists or the legislative council who's doing the legal research. So if you really care about something and you really have a lot of knowledge about something, you can very well be the encyclopedia on the shelf for that legislator in your district. And if you develop a relationship with them, call them about it, tell them you've got that expertise, tell them why you think what you know is important relative to the issue that they're dealing with, um, you can have a really outsized impact. So I used to go around the state, talk with people about the issues that we had in common and, and get them to develop those relationships. And that, that helps the issues in the building that I was working on. Yeah, so um, I, I know uh, when you mentioned Bernie's name, you know, I just, you know, I was thinking of, you know, talking about on 92, I know um, Bernie used to have all this youth stuff that uh, we oh, do yeah. every year at- um, 242. 242 and, and, and at um, UVM. Yeah. We, you know, he gave these, these youth little certificates uh, for being a part of um, um, the, you know, to taking, uh, being a part of the issues and concerns of what youth want to do. And, and um, just like you, you know, he would tap around wherever he had to go to talk to people. 
And one thing you got to say I love about you and Bernie is that it was when you see Bernie on the news and he's in Washington, he say, I, I went to Burlington and I talked to Donna about health care. And, um, and she said, right. we need to lower the cost. He mean it. He, has, he, those actually, are real he actually talked to Donna for <laughs> real. And, and a lot of people might think that might be some just somebody that's don't, a politician. That's, you right. know, <clears throat> no, but, no. Bernie, Bernie really worked hard to get around the state. I mean, it's harder now that he's a senator and in a, in a bigger position working on some of the really biggest issues of the day right now. So some folks get frustrated that he's not getting out and about as much. But, uh, you know, he he is down there um, fighting on those issues that he's been been, been elevating for decades. Yeah. Uh, it's decades. just amazing. Yeah. So um, so um, so then you, you OK, now, and you was elected as a lieutenant governor. Sure. And um, I know you fought for those same type of issues and, you know, same, you know, you, you weren't changing up or nothing, but you, you did have more power, you know, and so. Yeah. Um, what did what did you do? Well, it's interesting. Lieutenant governor has more power and less power. It kind of depends on on some of the lens. Uh, as lieutenant governor, you're no longer serving on committees with people. You're no longer actually a policymaker, mm. uh, and so you have a, a bigger podium to speak from, but you've actually got less day to day power in shaping legislation. Um, and so I tried to use the office in the, in the part of, uh, that I had been doing as a legislator, but on my spare time, now it was during the time of being lieutenant governor, was to travel the state, really help bring the discussion that was happening in Montpelier down to Springfield or over to Danville or you know, to different corners of the state, um, and, uh, and really continue to try to elevate the conversation to make more room for the policymakers to keep moving in a more progressive direction, whether it was, you know, universal health care, raise the minimum wage, climate legislation, um, you know, paid family leave. It, it's it's a fascinating role because as lieutenant governor, you're a statewide office holder, so you think there's a lot of power, mm -hmm. but really the governor has the administrative role for the state, and as lieutenant governor, your job is primarily to make sure you run the proceedings of the Senate uh, within the rules and, and within a, a respectful way. And I really did try to do that. It was interesting. I think there were a number of more moderate to conservative Democrats and some Republicans who were pretty freaked out when I got elected lieutenant governor. And I think they were surprised because while I am very progressive on my issues and my views, I'm, I'm a fairly strong um, supporter of the institution of how our system is supposed to work. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think when we think about, you know, really kind of disrupting the system, um, it, it has both successes and real pitfalls. I mean, you look at the last president who disrupted the system and, and there's some real discord now. Uh, and it's, it's hard if, if, if the <clears throat> faith in the workings of democracy gets undermined and there's too much cynicism about it and people don't believe it works, then it doesn't work. I mean, it only works if we all buy into the fact that the system can be fair. Now, there are problems with the system, don't get me wrong. The number of people that can run for office and represent different viewpoints is really limited because if you don't have access to money or people with money, how do you run for office? Right. So I think there's major changes that need to happen around campaign finance. Um, so that everyday people have a better shot. We're seeing a few more people able to run with some of the grassroots systems that Bernie really opened the door on. But, um, but it's still a, a wealthy white man's game. And, um, you know, unless you're someone who's really fighting and scrapping to work your way up the system uh, like I did, although I'm also a white man and I grew up in a fairly uh, well-off family. My dad was a doctor. I've never hidden that. Um, it if you're in and you should no and if but if you're in a if you're in a household that talks politics while you're growing up and mm -hmm. has resources to be able to have a little bit of free time to explore what's going on in the world it gives you an advantage yeah, it does. Um, if you're working 60 hours a week and you're just trying to keep your house going there's no time to then also be engaged in the political process and call your legislator you're just trying to get home in time to take your kid to the after school program to then zip off over to the other kid and pick them up at childcare and get to the grocery store and get home and make dinner. And 
you pass out exhausted. Yeah, definitely. So um, we need a system that makes it so that everyday people have, have a greater opportunity mm -hmm. to lend their voice into it. Um, so I'm not saying the system is perfect. Mm -hmm. right. but, uh, but as lieutenant governor, you really preside over the rules of the Senate to make sure every voice that speaks up has a chance. Um, and uh, some people can wield that power in a way that really slants the direction of the conversation. And I don't, that's not really the job. The, the lieutenant governor is kind of the referee of the Senate. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. But I, so, you know, then I ran for governor a year ago. And uh, when I kicked off my campaign in January, I think a lot of folks thought that it was uphill but winnable. We don't upend our incumbents very mm -hmm. easily in this state or anywhere. Um, but then two months later, the pandemic struck. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, that was really the main issue. Yeah, you couldn't and do as much work as you wanted to do. And like, and like you know, you, you, yeah. you and um, Bernie and are all boots on the ground. And, uh, and, and I so, couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't travel around the state and visit with people. There were no events to be had. The governor had press conferences two or three days a week. We were all fixated on them to find out what we were going to do about the pandemic and what were the things we needed to do to protect each other and care for our neighbors. And uh, so he had a, he had a, he had a platform yeah. and nothing else mattered. And Great so, opportunity. Yeah. yeah. And, it, you know, uh, I'm sure it was incredibly hard work. I, I don't uh, I don't envy him having to make the yeah. kinds of decisions he had to make. And I think he did a reasonably jo good job with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I still disagreed with him on a bunch of other issues, but right, that sure. didn't that didn't matter. I don't matter. Yeah. But so, um, you know, both of us know Governor Scott for God on forever. Yeah. You know, when he was lieutenant governor. Yeah. And, and then um, senator before that. And senator before that. So. Um, and, and like you say, you don't think he did, he've done a, you know, done an unreasonable job about, I guess, in whole as the governor well, or? Well, no, I mean, I, I, I ran yeah, against him because I thought there were some issues that he really, um, and I didn't have the same views and I thought he was out of step with a huge number of Vermonters, mm -hmm. uh, minimum wage, uh, the climate legislation that he vetoed, um, uh, you know, he, at first pushed back against the position of racial equity and governance and then adjusted the bill a little bit and finally got it through and I mean he's vetoed more bills than any other governor in four years in the history of Vermont. So there were a number of things that I disagree with him on. With respect to COVID, you know, he, uh, he did generally follow the science early on. He, he was slow to, uh, to mandate masks and both myself and Rebecca Holcomb who was the other, one of the other candidates in the primary were pushing for a mask mandate back early on because it was quite clear that <laughs> that would reduce the right. spread. And six feet distance. And, right, well, he talked about that, but he wouldn't do the mask mandate. Oh, and finally yeah. he did, and, and our numbers were really good. And Vermonters cared for our neighbors. We brought each other food. We looked out for each other, and we kept our numbers really good. Yeah. And, um, and I think mm -hmm. he certainly deserves some credit for that, as do the people of the state of Vermont, because sure. frankly, we are, you know, we did get vaccinated at a higher rate and so forth. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think one of the things we have to learn to do, and we thankfully still do it in Vermont, is we can compliment people we disagree with. So right. I disagree with them on a bunch of issues, yeah, yeah. and I think he did a good job with right. COVID. Yeah. That's, right. sure. that's fine. We need to do more of that. No doubt about it. So, so um, Vermont is changing because of Patrick, Senator Patrick Leahy, sure. who's um, res Retiring, sure. For some, well, I don't know, incredible years. How many years? Eighteen. Yeah, it'll 16? be forty-eight by the time. How, how, how many years in the Senate? Forty-eight. Gosh. Yeah. Forty-eight years in Seven, the Senate. Seventy-four. Uh, he got elected. Oh wow. And it'll be the twenty twenty-two, wow. like January twenty twenty-three. Wow. Well, isn't yeah. that an incredible record? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, and so um, people are jumping in line right fast. Well, what you know, I, you know, you you know, you can figure. What, you know, they should, I guess. Yeah, yeah. They, you know, it's an important position. Uh, you know, Peter Welsh is uh, moving from the House to hopefully, in his opinion, hoping to be in the Senate. Um, I had posted a op-ed in Digger that I thought was going to be about a week before Leahy announced, but it was actually just a couple hours before, <laughs> um, indicating that I thought it, it would be a good time for him to um, not seek re-election because I think he and Bernie and Peter have set the state on a, on a beautiful path for the next 10 years in terms of money to get us through rebuilding, you know, from the first infrastructure bill that just passed, but also some of the COVID money. I mean, one of the things back to Governor Doug, uh, Scott, Vermont has benefited tremendously from federal money. Mm -hmm. uh, while we were supposed to get ballpark, I think 
billion dollars, we actually got 2.4, give or take, billion. We got a billion extra dollars because of a policy that uh, Senator Leahy and others have, have continued since Senator Aiken originally implemented it with cohorts across this country for small states to get a, a minimum allocation. So even though our population would only garner us X dollars, the small state minimum got us X plus dollars. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons I would argue Phil Scott's done so well is he's had an extra billion, right. uh, with a B, billion dollars yeah, yeah, I get it. to help our businesses, to offer free shots and free COVID tests. I mean, in other states, they can't get COVID tests as much as we can. And now they just announced the free, you know, the free rapid sure. tests and stuff and, and boosters. And we're able to do that because of federal money. Um, so I sometimes chuckle that our small government governor uh, has gotten to oversee the biggest government <laughs> spending in the history of the state. But in any case, um, I think Senator Leahy and Bernie and, and Peter did a great job of sticking up for Vermont. And so one of, the, one of the dilemmas for a small state like ours is that if you gain seniority in the House or the Senate, that's worth something. It helps you get, you know, bring money back for airports or brownfield cleanup or investments in childcare or whatever it is. So they made a lot of money come back to Vermont these last few years. And, um, and we're going to lose that seniority. Mm -hmm, but, definitely. but we're well set up for the next five or 10 years with, with bills they're passing now mm -hmm. to bring money in. So I said, you know, it is time for new blood. Right. Uh, and I, I had urged Peter Welsh to stay in the House because now we're going to have two people with no seniority. He'll have no seniority in the Senate. And then whoever goes into the House will have no seniority. So Vermont's going to be in a very different position with Bernie being the only person with a fair amount of seniority, and he's up for election in two years, and who knows what he's going to do. Right. Um, but yeah, so uh, Peter jumped into the, into, the, into the race for Senator Leahy's seat, uh, and now more recently the lieutenant governor has jumped into the race for the House seat. Um, I happen to think that probably Peter and uh, the lieutenant governor both maybe knew about Leahy's intentions earlier than many of the rest of us sure. based on decisions they made. You know, the fact that uh, Peter hired some pretty big campaign people, you know, six, seven months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, the Lieutenant Governor Molly Gray uh, raised money right out of the gate as a Lieutenant Governor for sure. uh, for an election campaign when people never did but that. But it's her first term, right? For it's Lieutenant her first Gov term and in January, February of her first term of a two-year term, she raised like 50 grand for, mm -hmm. for electioneering, and we just don't do that in Vermont. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in many ways, they're sort of the inside track folks, but there's other couple people who are thinking about running for Congress. We've heard their names, Keisha Rahm, Becca Ballant. They both have uh, a number of years of public service, having served in the legislature, uh, House and Senate for Keisha and the Senate for Becca. So they have more understanding of making bills and writing laws than certainly the lieutenant governor does. Um, but the lieutenant governor's got the inside track with respect to probably endorsements and money. So it'll be really interesting well, to who see. Who said it again? The lieutenant governor does because oh, she, yeah. she grew I, up. I, yeah. There's a lot of discussion about how she grew up on a farm, which she did. Um, her father is highly respected um, farmer in Newbury. Um, but they were engaged and, and, role, and active with the Democratic Party back when she was a kid. So she knew Madeleine Cunin when she was a kid running around. Right. She knew Leahy. She knew Welsh. Right. And so the familial ties, we were talking earlier about the different advantages people have. Um, you know, she, she, was, she came out of nowhere and won the lieutenant governor's office and was able to raise $400,000, mm -hmm. mostly because of a lot of the connections that were there. And um, now it'll be interesting to see for this next office, how hard people dig in terms of uh, where she stands on issues and, and what she's for. And mm -hmm. I'm sure um, Keisha Ram and, and Becca will bring up issues that they've worked sure. on in the legislature. And yeah, we'll Keisha, see what happens. Keisha, I've known her from right out the gate from college. And yeah. um, we, you know, I had everybody I could think of to support her on everything she once tried to do. And, um, and, and most, most of them did. And, um, and she is so smart. And um, she, like you say, she know the rules. She's really for the people. She actually really are for the people of Vermont. I know that I'm, I'm saying this. From, yeah, from your experience. From my, from my experience and, and for the love I have for her for as a friend right. and as a as just in, on one hand and in the other hand, you know. Yeah. But um, and I don't know, you know, you the first, I was the first time I heard from that she she could be running for on Congress. 
um, and um, she'd be an incredible candidate. Because, you know, I like Peter, you know. I well, really, he's I, running for Leahy's seat, yeah, so yeah, it's but, a separate race. No, I'm but. saying I, I really, I, through my years, um, you know, <laughs> it's so funny because I'm, I'm, I'm a youth service provider, and uh, I work with the coalitions around the state sure. of Vermont. And one year we went up to to the Capitol to visit our, our senators and congressmen. And one time I was sitting, so we went in Peter's office, and... Um, you know, it's a, fun, it's a funny story. And and, and uh, all of us couldn't, you know, we have no room. can't fit. These rooms are right. small. And so he said, Peter, so you can sit over there at his desk. So yeah. I'm like, whoa, I get to sit at his desk. And so they're taking pictures of me. And then so one day we was at some event in Burlington, I don't know, a uh, Kiss Safe Collaborative event or something, I think it was. And he said, yes, and there's that guy, Bruce Wilson, <laughs> who took over my office. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. So I thought it was funny. But anyways, um, from I, I really, on the other hand, I don't, hear, I don't hear nothing about them. Why don't I don't? And I'm not saying this is not bad or good because it's just me. One person said it. Don't hear nothing. And I don't hear nothing f about him. I don't know what his record is. I don't know actually what he's actually done um, for us. Right. I hope that you can share something with me. And um, and so as he going into it as a senator, could he seem like a soft? He's a soft spoken or a good listener. Yeah. You know. But I don't know what, you know, what's... So can you tell me some of the well, things that he might have accomplished for us in Vermont? Well, I mean, he certainly, um, I think, has brought a lot of uh, Vermont's values where people accept the folks of different views and you can sit at the table and still try to work them out, which one thing is Washington doesn't seem to have a lot of that. So that's, I think, a very high quality of his. Um, but, you know, at the same time, you know, my, my inspiration was Bernie, you know, someone who's going to go out there and really bring these issues to the forefront, right. elevate the issues of working people, struggling people, folks who are sometimes not, not in, the, in the main uh, tranche of, of leaders mm -hmm. and try to help other people come into, the, into leadership or uh, get taken care of. Right. Um, and I think Vermont could certainly send more of that to Montpelier. Um, or excuse me, to Washington. And, uh, you know, he's, he's done a fair amount on the agricultural side. I think he's on the agriculture committee as well. Um, and uh, he's, he's tried to be a part of this, uh, the Problem Solvers Caucus, I think it's called, which is a group of moderate Democrats and moderate Republicans to try to find solutions that, that all sides will come to on. So in some ways, I think that, that sometimes is a quieter effort. Um, and uh, I, I'm sure he's met with some success and some struggles. Um, but it'll be interesting because he's running for the Senate. I think he'll be 73 or 74 mm -hmm. by the time the election happens. So mm -hmm. six years later, mm -hmm. he's going to be up around 80, 81, just like Senator Leahy is when he's saying, I'm not going to run again. So it's an interesting situation where he's going from 18 years of seniority in the House to where he'll be almost no seniority in the Senate. And after That's his first age. term, who knows if he's going to run again right, or not. Exactly. Um, and, uh, you know, you mentioned Keisha, and I just do want to mention that uh, Senator Becca Ballant mm -hmm. um, has fought for some pretty good issues as well. And one of the things I think will be interesting just in terms of the dynamics, I don't know how it's going to play out, but Keisha is going to be probably campaigning mostly to the, to the small P progressive side of the issues. Um, I think Molly Gray is going to be sort of the, the moderate, don't make anybody upset, Democrat kind of person, and then, and, and part of the institution really, like I said, she's connected to the Leahy world and the Welsh world and the Madeline Cunin world sure, and sure. Howard Dean and Peter Shumlin. So she's gonna be the institutional candidate, um, kind of like Hillary and Bernie, right? right? Hillary was the institutional candidate. Bernie was the one who's really out there fighting for people. Um, and then you've got Becca who, I think on issues is fairly progressive, but she's also part of the institution because she's in leadership. She's the president pro tem. And the other thing is she's a bit, um, well, she's closer to our age. I mean, she's, I think, 53, and both of the others are in their 30s. And so I think people really need to think about both the issues and life experience that folks bring. Mm -hmm. uh, and do we want someone who's, you know, had some life experience? She's the only one of the three with children. Um, and uh, one of them has uh, developmental disabilities, I think, autism maybe. So she's got that experience. Keisha's got the experience of being a, a woman of color um, and of mixed race parents and, uh, you know, fighting for progressive issues and but a bit younger. And Molly's never really served in office. She didn't vote for 10 years. 
grew up in a politically connected family. I don't know why she didn't vote. When you've, when you've learned about politics your whole life growing up, you'd think it was pretty important to vote. Um, but she's also, um, she's, she's quite smart as well. She's a legal trained lawyer and has done some activities around the globe. Uh, so people have a lot to weigh between them. Um, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. So I guess, you know, candidates always, uh, not always, but a lot of them talk about, well, you know, you and Bernie, you always ask the question. That's why you did all these town meetings or walking through the, going to the neighborhoods or for, to the people who, who you serve getting answers. Um, but a lot of candidates seem to, they come up with they, their own answers. You know, they don't do, they do not on boots on the ground no more like, hi, hey, I'm Bruce Wilson. Here's my, you know, this is who I answer my bio. Right. Vote for me, you know. But you know, I don't, I don't necessarily, a lot of them don't seem to necessarily know what the people want. You know, like how do you, how do you, how does a candidate get elected without working on really for the people who they serve based on what the people want? So you can say well, health care, you can say health care and jobs, well we got plenty of jobs, huh? jobs and all these other things that, um, worldwide issue things you could talk about, right. you know, which everybody want, you know, we don't want no wars, no, whatever. And we are, everybody don't want these changes. Right. But, um, but that's not grassroots, that's not, that's yes. not down, that's not really what the people want and based on what they really need. Yeah, so how do we do it, that? It's, it's tricky, you know, ultimately as a candidate running for statewide office, it's hard to have a conversation with all 600 plus thousand people. Sure. Right. Um, yeah. And in the age of COVID, it's particularly hard to have even group meetings with people and say, well, what's on your mind and what do you care about? And, you know, I think it is important as a candidate to be really clear about what you are coming to the table with. What is your life experience? What are the issues you care about that you, that you think everybody else cares about or, or a majority of the people care about? And how are you going to execute that? How are you going to um, work with other people to get those policies passed? Because you, you have to be able to both... Um, articulate the issues you care about and be able to uh, persuade others in the policymaking circles to uh, work on the same issue and to vote for it. Uh, and, you know, sometimes folks can be a great candidate because they get along with everybody and, and uh, uh, people might think they have good ideas, but then they may be a, a terribly unpersuasive person with their colleagues. Mm -hmm. Or Someone may be incredibly smart, <clears throat> but not really be very personable and be able to relate with folks. Right. And so they're not a great candidate, but they might be a great negotiator. Um, and so, you know, I think people just have to take the time to really try to learn who everybody is. You know, you got to, as a candidate, make yourself available, what you stand for, but also um, uh, available to talk with people and listen to their issues. And that way uh, you learn as a candidate and people feel heard as a candidate. Um, and, uh, and people need to hopefully find some time to do a little bit of that homework and send messages. I mean, one of the things that people don't realize is you can reach out to campaigns and candidates and, and get an answer back because most people don't reach out. So I've always just said, right. reach out. Like it means more work for someone in office. Absolutely. But it's their job yeah, to we, answer we, your question. We shouldn't just, um, the person who's in theory next in line shouldn't just get it because they seem to be next in line. And yeah, that's or how connected Vermont, or whatnot. Vermont um, politics usually go. You know, I mean, if you're if you're if a Senate seat's open, you're the congressman, and then you slide right up. You know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. But I'm saying that that's you know, and that seems like that's how it goes. That's how it's been going here. But um, that's not that's not right. Well, I mean, to me, that's I think earlier we mentioned public financing and and various things like that. You know, ultimately, being connected. Uh, opens doors to both meetings with people that can give you the information you need so you can articulate well on the issues or be articulate on the issues um, and raise money because really if you if you're not connected to enough people with enough money that you know you can go a long way with hundreds of people giving you 20 or 25 bucks and that's great but you need thousands of those yeah. versus you know you get 30 Four thousand dollar checks running for statewide office, and there's 120 grand. You've raised, you know, a third of what you need. Um, and so, uh, those connections and sort of who's picked by the insiders really does give them a leg up because those folks who are supporting them have all those connections. 
You know, when I first got involved, I was running as a progressive from Burlington. Mm -hmm. I think there were three in the state house at the time and one retired when I got elected. So there were three of us out of 180 legislators. Uh, I certainly never thought I was going to be a senator or lieutenant governor because there's no way with a third party label you're going to get all those connections and all those networks of people saying, oh, yeah, no, I'll get you money and I'll door knock for you and I'll do this and I'll do that. Um, but but most of the time, the people that move up the ladder are the people that are connected. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to work triply hard uh, if you're not part of the inner circle, mm -hmm. um, which is, I think, one of the struggles for communities of color, for women, for a lot of different positions where it's been a, a white male club. And so how do you become connected when you're not part of that club? Right. And you know, thankfully, some aspects of those barriers are being broken down, but there's still plenty of those barriers. So what is the, what, what is the money used for? Why do, you, why, why do we need, you know, I understand why we need, why can they need money, some, you know, some money but well, why do they need the, you know, like the most money to, to make the, sure. the biggest outcome? No, I think that's a great question. And, and sometimes it's frustrating as someone who's run for office and had to raise money. It's just like, my God, what, are we, what could we be doing for good with all this money? Um, but the reality is you've got to get your face and your message in front of people. And you either do it through mailings, which cost a lot of money, or through TV ads, which cost a lot of money or through radio ads, which don't cost as much money, but still cost money. And if you're running statewide, that means you're also gonna have some campaign staff. You've got a campaign manager who's helping connect the media to your campaign and trying to make things happen, who's trying to set up events for you. You've got uh, volunteer coordinators and people that help get folks out in neighborhoods all over the state, leafleting and trying to make events happen. Uh, you know, so you've got staff to pay, you got mailings to do. Usually you end up renting an office for the six or 12 months. Um, and so it just, unfortunately, uh, that all takes a fair chunk of change. Yeah, um, I can do that. I was so, doing the math as you was talking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> when I ran for lieutenant governor the first time, I think we raised about 380000 mm -hmm. over the course of a year. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we, many would argue we barely had the money we needed for TV. I think we only did about twenty-five or $30,000 of TV ads. You know, these, these Senate races and House races, they're going to spend a couple hundred thousand dollars on TV. Mm -hmm. And if, if uh, big money comes in from out of state to try to tip one of the seats towards the Republicans, which I, I doubt they'll spend much here. There's much hotter, uh, more competitive districts elsewhere. But if they do, you can start talking about millions of dollars on TV. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, people have seen it. They get sick of all the TV ads. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just bonkers. Yeah, it's a lot. So, um, so this is going to be very interesting. Do um, you know anybody might be running for Senate? I uh, mean, for U.S. U.S. Senate. For U.S. Senate, well, the U.S. Senate, it's going to be Peter Welsh, and then uh, um, any other? Okay. there's a woman in. Uh, I've heard. I can't remember her name. Uh, she lives in uh, the Mad River Valley, and she's a excuse me. She's a doctor in Waitsfield, mm -hmm. and she's partly running. She feels because. You know, just because Peter's been there doesn't mean he deserves the inside track. Maybe it's time for some fresh blood. Um, and uh, I haven't heard of anybody else at mm. this point. Uh, if uh, earlier on, uh, Tanya Vihovsky from uh, Essex had talked about maybe running for the U.S. Senate. Oh, I know. Uh, but I don't believe she's going to at this point. I think just the fact that Peter Welsh has $2 million that he's carrying over from his House campaign is pretty formidable and he's already Bernie's already endorsed him that makes it hard for someone to, to run against him mm -hmm. uh, you know I think Peter Welsh made a pledge this time to not take any corporate PAC money but um, I've heard quite a few people frustrated that he's still going to keep the money that he got from corporate PACs that is in his fund I mean maybe if he were to um, look at his past fundraising and see what percentage came from people and what percentage came from corporate PACs and then said okay well if I've got two million and 30% has been coming from corporate PACs. Maybe I'll take 600000 and give it to donations to kids groups or others um, rather than campaigning with it anymore. Uh, he chose not to do that, which, you know, I like Peter, but that's frustrating to me is to say, well, I'm not going to take corporate money, but I've already got corporate money. Mm -hmm. it doesn't, that doesn't jive for me. But For anyone who wants to donate to Art So Wonderful or Service <laughs> Rent Incorporated, just go. look us up and s send us that money, and we'll... Um, <laughs> Make sure, as, like we have been doing since 1999, primarily with you service providers, 
um, helping youth and families with their goals and aspirations while providing safe places. And we have over 50 awards for doing it. So Bruce Wilson, Art So Wonderful, Service Women Incorporated. There you go, indeed. Um, so let's talk about um, what you're doing now. <laughs> well, I know you, you know, you're a farmer, but yeah. you've been a farmer for how long now? For, forever. Yeah, well, I started a farm in 99, so I'm going into my 22nd or 23rd year, and I worked for others for wow. five years before that. Wow. So basically I've done both most of the time along, and yeah. um, we raise about 20 acres of vegetables, all certified organic, part of the Real Organic Project as well. Uh, we now have a boar and 14 sows, so we sell maybe 100 plus piglets in the spring, and we raise about 30 or 40 hogs for meat. We raise about 1,000 to 1,200 chickens that we <laughs> slaughter each year, and then we got about 75 laying hens. So we got a busy farm. Um, Dang, how many eggs you get? How many eggs? Uh, well, in the Does, summer we were getting... A dozen? Getting, the dozens. Oh, yeah, no. In the summer we were getting about 70 or 80 a day, and now we're down in about 45 to mm -hmm. 50 a day. They lay fewer when the daylight is shorter like this. Mm -hmm. But, uh, mm. yeah, so we've, you know, it's... Um, it's been nice to be back on the farm full time. I'm picking up pieces of frayed edges that happened because I was in politics. I wasn't there all the time. And um, I think one of the really nice things about, you know, there's a silver lining to losing a race for governor and, and being home all the time, which is that I've got a lot more time with my daughter. Mm -hmm. I'm home for dinner every night, you know, for, uh, I was in office for 22 of the last 20, well, 25 years now, but had been 22 of the prior 24. Uh, and I was, I was away from home, you know, two or three, sometimes yeah, four nights you. a week. I bet. And uh, at least for the dinner hour, I might get home at 10 or 11 if I was down in Brattleboro or Bennington or up in the Northeast Kingdom somewhere. And um, so I'm home, and it's nice to be home with my family. My daughter's in high school. So uh, it's nice this next couple of years, I think, staying home and focusing on, on that, at least mm. until she decides what's going to happen after high school. And then, uh, then who knows what will happen after that. Well... Let's check this out. All right, so we got like like five minutes. Um, so here you are, <laughs> 22 years, well experienced <laughs> person in legislators, the senator, and as lieutenant governor. Sure. Oh my God. I mean, I don't think any of the candidates have more experience than you in any of these areas. And so um, there's a Congress seat <laughs> open, and there's a senator. I mean, yeah, it, it you will fit perfectly. <laughs> It is, it's tempting, and I, I really appreciated the, uh, there's a number of people that have reached out to me through phone calls, emails, you know, social media, urging me to run or asking me if I'm going to run, and, and it's very flattering, and, and I appreciate it. Um, you know, there's, it's amazing. In, in the 25 years I was in office, there was only one cycle, 2006, when uh, a House and Senate seat came up then, because uh, Jeffords, Jeffords didn't yeah. run, Bernie moved to the Senate. And Peter ran for the House. And I considered running for the House. I did not. Mm. But um, there you go again. And, but that was once, you know, once in like 25 years. But two years from now, Bernie's up. Uh, six years or seven years from now, uh, the seat that Peter's in will be up again and, and he'll be 80, 81. Um, so uh, I think, you know, and who knows what the governor's doing, whether he's going to run again this time or next time. Oh, true. So I think there will be... Or he might run from, he might run from a U.S. Senate. I don't think he will. There, there's, uh, he, he said this, and I agree with him completely. I was saying the same thing, but he had a bigger, bigger microphone. Vermont right now is not going to send a Republican to Washington because uh, <clears throat> as much as we're okay as a population, clearly, from the election last year, with him being governor, the balance of power... Of a, of a Senate majority Democrat or Senate majority Republican, mm. the consequences are huge. Yes, yeah, true. And, and so um, I think there's a lot of Democrats who crossed over and voted for him for governor that wouldn't do that for him for a congressional seat. Because if that meant McCarthy was going to be the Speaker in the House or McConnell was going to be the majority leader in the Senate, uh, Vermonters couldn't stand for that. Not after McConnell stole the, uh, you know, the Supreme Court seats uh, and stymied, you know, that situation. And now we're, we're dealing with the consequences of that and will for a long time. Mm -hmm. I just think it becomes much more important, the party label for running for Washington than it does for running for governor or lieutenant governor. Um, but, I th you know, I just think that that Phil might be relatively tired. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's, he's uh, uh, I think he enjoys but doesn't love the job. 
And this last year and a half has been particularly struggle, you know, with COVID as, as it would be for anybody in that office. So uh, there may be opportunities in the future. Uh, you Who know, knows, Governor Douglas might come back. Yeah, I don't think so either. Or he's a Republican. <laughs> yeah. But I, I want to say to about one thing about Governor Douglas. It could be 50 people in the room. He knew everybody's he name. He knows everybody's name. How do you, I don't know how you there's, do that. There's just a natural ability that. there that is wow. uh, unbelievable. He remembered that, those names, man. Yep. I'm like, I can't believe it. You know, so. That's, that's a, a biological gift for anybody that wants to run ah. for office because, boy, if you can remember everyone's name or what happened to their dog when you visited their house with the broken leg, you know, whatever. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you could remember every detail like that. <laughs> just incredible, yeah, incredible my, skill. Yes, he. Um, yeah, that's true. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I have um, I've worked hard for a lot of issues and, and made a lot of friends, certainly made some enemies. Um, and, and maybe we'll see what the future holds. Mm. Uh, there's, but there's time for that. And, uh, you know, this time around, I, I think for the most part, I'm going to stay on the sidelines and, and give analysis like I just did on this show and uh, sort of try to help people you know, think about what they want to think about in terms of these folks who might be running and, and what are you looking for and what issues matter to you and what experience matters to you and, and how much integrity do these folks have and how do you how do you gauge that? Um, you know, maybe I can help because whoever wins may well be in Washington for 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no doubt I think it. Vermonters really need to dig deep and think about what is it that you want to be the voice for no you. No doubt about it. That's what I'm talking because about. Because once you're in, uh, it's hard to, you usually don't get bumped out. No, that's true. And so, um, you know, I think folks should really look at each of their experience, mm -hmm. where they stand on the issues, um, who they try to placate or why, and, uh, mm. and really um, think long and hard about this because this decision is going to have sure. ramifications for a long time. I, I know, I know, um, you know, Senator Rams, you know, she, she, um, she always asks the same questions to everybody. So how do you see me there? How do you see me do what I do? And here's the things that are all the things that I've done based on the people who I serve. And, and she's right on, right on. You know, so I really like her. Um, and she, she could be, the, the, she's the, definitely the youngest probably. I don't know if um, Molly, uh, Molly she is. She and Molly are very similar ages. I don't know who's younger, but yeah. And she, uh, she, either one of them can be, like you said, in, in, their, in the um, house, whatever, for 30 years, 33 years, whatever. Yeah. Well, you know, I live in Winooski, and just, just, just so you know, I'm, I am the Winooski Democratic Party chairman. Oh, good. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, we, we just had a meeting, our first meeting the yeah. um, other day, and our goal is to help, um, you know, um, the community with um, voters registration. We want to do, um, we want to make sure equity and inclusion in, um, is involved in what we do. Uh, Winooski is so diverse. Oh, People it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's beautiful, amazing. isn't it? And when they need, all need to know, Exactly what, um, like, first of all, they need to know what, what a mayor does or what a, what a, you know, legislators done, what they do, what their roles are. Because sure. how does it work? Really nobody actually went door to door to, or actually talked to them about the roles of our, our, can, our people who serve us. Yeah. And, they, and one of the things I'm going to make sure they do in, in our, our SR team is they know that. They, yeah, they know. when I was running for governor, I actually walk down the streets of Winooski both to visit some stores and businesses and over to some housing and um, it was it was a joy such a joy and, yeah, and to chat place. with folks and it is yeah yep, but absolutely. you know they um, a lot of those individuals especially new Americans don't get the information that they should you know it's and like, hard it, and they should have um, they should also might have some candidates who, who might be able to run for want to run for something I'm sure they have Issues and concerns and ideas right. and suggestions. Yeah, that we definitely want going to hear and want to hear. So, um, you know, I'm, it's it's interesting. I'm excited to be, this will be my first year as the chairman yep. of Democratic Party in Winooski. Um, and I think that I really well, I hope you get people engaged. You know, that's the main thing is is help people recognize why it matters. You know, uh, we thankfully in Vermont have a higher participation rate, mm -hmm. but. You know, decisions that affect your life every day, one way or the other, are being made for you. And, uh, you know, from <clears throat> street lights and road paving and things like that to schools and education and, and how the tax system works and whether you're going to pay more or less or what support is there for you for uh, education or child care or job training or any number of things. You know, what, 
what are we going to do about the climate? All those things yeah, are, climate, yeah. uh, you know, are factors that are going to impact us in our lives for the next five, 20 years. And that's where voting matters. No doubt. So, um, Mr. Zuckerman, <laughs> it's always good to, you know, have you on our so show. It's so good to see you. And it see you. See you yeah. um, would you got some parting words? Parting words. Uh, take your time as you make a decision of who you're going to support. You know, a lot of times people jump on bandwagons real early and then they learn something later that, oops, I didn't know that about that person or, oh, I wish I knew that about them. I would have gotten supportive of them. Mm -hmm. Give yourself some time to kick the tires a little bit mm -hmm. and uh, call the campaigns, you know, pay attention more than just the last two weeks of the election and, um, and keep an open mind. You know, there's a lot of people out there on the right, far right and far left that uh, I think sometimes uh, express views so adamantly and then don't have their ears open to understand why someone thinks something that they do. And I'm not saying you ever have to agree with someone. That's, that's entirely up to each individual. But we, we all come from different places with different experiences. And if we feel that, we, that our experience is absolutely the right one and we got to shove it down someone's throat, I don't care if it's right or left. It's usually hard to hear it when something's getting shoved down your throat. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we do need to figure out how to uh, push hard for what we care about, but push hard with respect. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, I guess that would be my, my mm -hmm. closing cool. words. Cool. And like, um, like I know for a fact that one vote and one person count because when I came to Vermont in 1989, the whitest state in America. Yeah. So now it's like the third or something. Right. So I know one one vote right. or one person count in in Vermont because right. here we are, the third whitest state. And I was came in when the first when it was the there first. There we go. And <laughs> we, both, we both came in '89. Right. I didn't realize that. So uh, yeah. Nine. So cool yeah. beans. All right, sir. Pleasure. Good Absolutely. to see you. Yes, sir. Have Absolutely. a good day. Thank you for tuning in to Service Rendered Straight Talk Vermont Show, and we'll see you next time.